Tonight, we're going to begin going verse by verse through the book of Colossians. And it's certainly a rich book. Uh, I like to do my introductions to books of the Bible as we make our way through the verses. So let's just open up to Colossians chapter 1, verse 1, and we'll read the first two verses. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossa. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, as is familiar to us, is following the normal letter-writing customs of his day. In our day, we have our own letter-writing customs. You put the a date in a certain place. You put who the sender is, the address, the recipient, all that sort of thing. Well, Paul was following just the normal letter-writing customs of his day when he began by mentioning himself. Paul, who was the author of the letter, of course, he wrote the letter while he was in prison. Later on in chapter 4, in several different places, chapter uh, 4, verse 3, verse 10, and verse 18, he's going to mention his own imprisonment. He probably wrote the letter from Rome. We don't know exactly what the date was in the early 60s AD. Paul probably wrote this letter because he was visited by a man named Epaphras. This man, Epaphras, will be mentioned a few times in the letter to the Colossians. And it seems that this man, Epaphras, was the founder of the church in Colossae. Significantly, and we'll find this out in chapter 2, verse 1, Paul never visited the city of Colossae. This was a church that Paul did not start. Now, we're so used to talking about the churches that Paul started, right? The letter he wrote to the Ephesians, and he started the church there. The letter he wrote to the Philippians, and he started the church in Philippi. The letter he wrote to the Corinthians, and he started the church in Corinth. We're so accustomed to thinking of Paul the missionary and church planter that sometimes it surprises us to think that he's writing a letter to a church that he never founded and that he never visited or wouldn't, hadn't visited at least up to the point of writing this letter. Now, why does he write it? Well, he writes it because of what he says there in the first verse. He's an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul was qualified to write this letter to the Colossians, even though he had never met them personally nor visited them, because he was an apostle. He was a special representative of the work of God on earth. So he wrote it again to Paul, but he was also with, excuse me, written by Paul, but then also accompanied by Timothy, our brother, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. So when Paul addressed the Colossian Christians, he didn't separate out out some specifically wonderful people and then the other ones who were sort of carnal. He addressed it to the whole congregation, to the saints and faithful brethren. And then again, these were the ones, as it says there in verse 2, to the saints and faithful brethren in Christ who are in Colossa. Now, Colossa was probably the smallest and the least important city that Paul ever wrote a letter to. It might surprise us that Paul would turn his attention to the Christians in Colossa at a time when he had so many other concerns. Paul, don't you have enough to worry about with the churches that you yourself founded? Paul, don't you have enough to worry about with your own imprisonment and upcoming trial before Caesar? Yet Paul apparently thought that the situation in Colossae was important enough for him to devote his apostolic attention. You see, apparently Paul wrote this letter because there were problems among the Christians in Colossae. The exact doctrinal problem that they experienced, which most people call the Colossian heresy, it's a little bit difficult to describe precisely. It probably was an early form of Gnosticism that was threatening the church. Now, if that word sort of uh, surprises you or you don't know exactly what it means, don't worry. We're not going to talk much about Gnosticism this evening, but we'll talk about it in future evenings when Paul gets into more of the meat of what the difficulty was doctrinally that the Colossians were facing. Just to put it very briefly, this Colossian heresy was probably a corruption of Christianity with elements of mystical and legalistic legalistic Judaism combined with an early form of Gnosticism. You see, you have to understand something about the first century religious environment. 
the religious environment of the Roman Empire in the first century was very much like the religious environment in the Western world today. It was a time of religious mixing, where people pretty much went to the religious salad bar, and they picked as they pleased, right? So you would have a religion with a little bit of this, and a little bit of that, and a little bit of something else. And so this threat that came to the Colossian church had a little bit of true Christian doctrine in it, but it was corrupted by a Jewish mysticism and legalism, and then they threw a little bit of Gnostic heresy in there just to mix it all up. There was a substantial difference, though, between the religious environment of today and the religious environment of the ancient world. In the first century, you joined a group that borrowed from many different religions. Today, you understand what people do? They borrow from many different religions for themselves. And that's a substantial difference, right? You ask people today, what do you believe? Say, well, I believe a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and I just kind of combine it together and my own sort of personal preference. Well, they combined religions in the ancient world, but usually groups did it, and then you joined the group that had borrowed from several different sources. Whatever the problem was precisely, Paul dwelt more on the solution than he did on the problem. You know what the solution was for the Colossians? They needed to understand Jesus Christ better. And I would suggest to you that even if your problem is not precisely the same as the Colossian heresy, that's still the solution for you. If you can understand Jesus Christ better, who he is and what he has done for you, that will be the solution to whatever doctrinal or, or oftentimes a moral or ethical problem as well. You see, knowing the real Jesus helps us stay away from the counterfeit, no matter how it comes packaged. And so this is going to be a letter that exalts Jesus Christ. It's going to put him up towards the forefront. Now, as we saw before, it was written to the Christians of Colossae. It might surprise you to know that the city of Colossae is not even mentioned in the book of Acts. All of our biblical information about the church there comes from this letter and a few allusions in the letter to Philemon. You see, from these sources, we learn that this man named Epaphras was responsible for bringing the gospel to the Colossians. He was a native of the city of Colossa, and he also got the message out to neighboring towns in what they called the Lysus Valley, such as Hierapolis and Laodicea. You've heard of the church at Laodicea, right? One of the seven letters to the seven churches in the book of Revelation was written to the church at Laodicea. Well, it seems that this man, Epaphras, started the church in Laodicea because it wasn't far from the city of Colossae. Well, where did Epaphras hear the gospel? Perhaps Epaphras heard the gospel himself when Paul was in Ephesus. As Paul taught in the lecture hall of Tyrannus, it's described in Acts chapter 19, verse 10, it says, all the residents of Asia heard the word of the Lord. In other words, people from many neighboring cities came and heard Paul when he was at Ephesus. It wouldn't be surprising if some people from Colossa, including this man Epaphras, heard the gospel when Paul was in Ephesus, and then they went back to their own hometowns and started churches there. Now, historically, Colossa was a prosperous city. It was famous, along with other cities in the region, for its fabric dyes. Yet at the time Paul wrote his letter to them, it was a city on the decline. And by the way, and this is sort of an ominous note, not long, apparently, after Paul sent this letter to the city of Colossa, and we don't know if it was after they received it or whatever, but shortly after Paul sent and assuming they received this letter, the city of Colossa was devastated by an earthquake. The, the church here didn't last in this city very long because of this great devastation. And Paul wrote the letter to them here, and continuing on in verse 2, he says, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. This is Paul's familiar but heartfelt greeting to them, and he greets them with the same sort of warmth that you would expect that he would use for the Ephesians or the Philippians, churches that he had founded and loved deeply. You see, I think there's something remarkable for us in this letter to the Colossians. It shows us that this letter that's full of love and concern was written to a church that Paul had neither planted nor visited. It shows the power of Christian love. You see, Paul didn't need to meet these Christians to love them. He didn't have to know them firsthand to have a deep concern for their condition. 
This shows us how powerful the love of Jesus Christ is as it works itself out in the lives of believers. Now, verse 3, we give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Paul had never met most of these Christians, but he still had them on his prayer list. He prayed for them not only often. It's one thing to say you pray for somebody often. Paul said he prayed for the Colossians always. And when he prayed for them, it says there in verse 3 that he give thanks. When Paul prayed for the Colossians, he did it full of gratitude. Now, starting here at verse 4, why Paul was thankful. Look at it carefully here. He says, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of your love for all the saints, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the world of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world, which is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. As you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the spirit. Now, did you notice this? Paul declares why he was thankful for the Colossian believers. And he, what prompted his thanks was hearing something. He says in there in verse four, since we heard, Paul was thankful for their faith in Christ Jesus and their love for all the saints and because he heard the good report from Epaphras about their condition. But not only was he thankful, as you see there in verse 4, for their faith in Christ Jesus and their love for all the saints, as he continues on, you can also see in verse 5 that he was thankful because of the hope which was laid up. Did you notice the familiar triad there? Faith, hope, and love right there in verses 4 and 5. See, I want you to notice, faith, hope, and love were not just theological ideas to Paul. No, these were things that dominated his thinking as a Christian. And so he says, uh, we heard of your faith in Jesus Christ, your love for all the saints, the hope that's laid up for you in heaven, uh, of which you heard before of the word of the truth of the gospel. Paul was thankful that their eternal destiny was affected by the truth of the gospel that was brought to them by Epaphras, whom he describes to them as a faithful minister of Christ on their behalf. And then the really good news, as he says here in verse 6, that the gospel when it came to you was bearing fruit. Did you see that in verse 6? And is bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you heard it and knew the grace of God in truth. You see, Paul was thankful that the gospel was bringing forth fruit all over the world. Now notice this, even while Paul was in a Roman prison. Isn't it funny that sometimes we tend to think that if we can't spread the gospel, then it's not being spread. It, it would be easy for Paul to think, here I am in a Roman prison. You know, nothing's happening. I can't be out planting churches. I can't be out spreading the gospel. Oh, sure, I can preach to a few soldiers who are nearby me. And yes, I can minister to a few from Caesar's household who come to my uh, house where I'm under house arrest from time to time. Yes, I can do all that. But, but surely the work of the gospel is greatly diminished because I'm in this prison cell. Paul did not feel that way at all. He knew that God was winning the victory. And so he said, listen, it's going out over all the world even if I am in this prison cell. It's kind of interesting, the wording that Paul uses here. He almost represents the gospel as if it were a traveler, someone walking throughout the whole earth. And the object of this traveler is to make a tour throughout the entire habited earth. And right now, Paul looks at that traveler and it's jogging. It's jogging all over the Roman Empire. It's not taking a, a leisurely stroll. Paul looks and he says, the gospel is spreading all over the habited world, all over the Roman domain, and it's going to continue to travel on until that message has been spread to every people, to every nation, and to every tongue. So after this greeting, after this heartfelt expression of gratitude that Paul expresses for the Colossians, now look at his prayer for the Colossian Christians. We begin with that starting at verse 9. He says, for this reason also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may have a walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God 
strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. Now, I want you to notice what Paul was asking for here. First, he asked for something right there in verse 9 to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Paul prayed that the Colossian Christians would have a knowledge of the will of God. Now, we want that, don't we? Don't people want to know the will of God for their lives? Okay, so we're tracking that prayer along with Paul here. But he wanted their knowledge of God's will to be informed by a true spiritual understanding. Notice that again in verse 9. That you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Now, I can just conceive in my mind of somebody who knows God's will for their life. But they don't know that will with wisdom and with spiritual understanding. Let me give you a contrast of some, uh, contrast of somebody who did have it with wisdom and spiritual understanding. Think of David. Okay. There's King David. Well, before he's a king, there's Shepherd David, right? Anointed to be the next king of Israel. Now, did he know from that moment on what God's will was for his life? Absolutely he did. He could wipe that anointing oil that had dripped down over his entire head, and he could say, I know that God's will for my life is to be the next king of Israel. I know that. Okay, but now comes in what Paul describes here. He describes it in verse 9, wisdom and spiritual understanding. If David would have forsaken wisdom and forsaken spiritual understanding, he might have said, I'm going to be the next king of Israel, and so I should go assassinate Saul so I could take the throne. I'm going to start a whispering campaign behind Saul's back to draw allegiance away from him. Or we can think of any other ungodly or unrighteous ways that David might have worked his way towards what he knew to be God's will for his life. So do you catch what I'm talking about here? It's one thing to know God's will, and we should know God's will, but it's even more important to know God's will in wisdom and in spiritual understanding. And sometimes I wonder if God does not withhold the knowledge of his will to us until we increase in wisdom and spiritual understanding, right? God says, you know, if you would get more wisdom in your life, if you would get more spiritual understanding in your life, then I would be free to reveal more of my will to you because then you could handle it. You see, Paul understood that this is what the Colossians needed. They needed wisdom. They needed spiritual understanding. They needed to know the will of God. Why? Look at verse 10. That you may have a walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him. Paul prayed that they would live according to the knowledge that they received and that they would live out a walk worthy of the Lord. I have to say, this is a wonderful turn of a phrase that we see repeated over and over again in the New Testament, that you may have a walk worthy of the Lord. In other words, look at all that the Lord has given you. Look at all that the Lord has done for you. Now walk worthy of that. You know, that's always the pattern in the New Testament. It isn't, you know, if you walk worthy for a few years, then maybe God will do something for you. Then maybe God will bless you. No, no, no. He says, look how God has blessed you. Now have a walk and a life worthy of that. And then I like how he continues here in verse 10, that you may have a walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, bearing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. You see, this is how we can be fully pleasing to God and how we can have a worthy walk. Do do you want to have a worthy walk? Then, being be fruitful in every good work and increase in the knowledge of God. I mean, that's just very practical Christian living there, right? Fruitful in every good work. Now, I like that. That's a room big enough for every one of us to find something to do in, right? Fruitful in every good work. I, I like what Spurgeon said about that. He said, do you have the ability to preach the gospel? Preach it. Does a little child need comforting? Comfort it. Can you stand up and vindicate a glorious truth before thousands? Do it. Does a poor saint need a bit of dinner from your table? Send it to her. 
Let works of obedience, testimony, zeal, charity, piety, and philanthropy all be found in your life. Do not select big things as your specialty, but glorify the Lord also in the littles, fruitful in every good work. Well, that's how we should be. Lord, every good work I can be fruitful in. You know, we might say that this is an echo of what Jesus said in John chapter 15, verses 7 and 8. Remember these verses. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, my father is glorified that you bear much fruit. So you will be my disciples. Isn't this what we want? Look here, verse 10, that you may have a walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. He's guiding the Colossians into where they needed to be thinking. They needed to be thinking, listen, let's have lives full of every good work. Let's have lives that are increasing in the knowledge of God. And then going on here, verse 11, strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience and long suffering with joy. You see, as we walk worthy of the Lord, his strength is there to help us meet all of life's challenges and to endure and to overcome problems with circumstances and with people. I like how he puts that in verse 11, where he says, for all patience, I think that's referring to endurance with circumstances, right? You got to be patient with circumstances, but you just don't have to be patient with circumstances. You also need patience with people, don't you? And so he says, and with long suffering so that you can be long-suffering towards people who might normally be annoying you all the time. And so this is the heritage of the Christian right here. Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy. Now, giving thanks, verse 12. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the son of his love in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Now, I think this is very interesting because in verses 9, 10, and 11, he thought about the things that God needed to do in the life of the Colossian believers, right? Um, Give them an increased understanding of the knowledge of his will in wisdom and spiritual understanding that they would be bearing, having lives full of, of fruit, being born unto God, that they would be increasing in the knowledge of God, that they would be strengthened in their Christian life. These were on the things of Paul's prayer list. Paul's just sort of sharing his prayer list. But now he shares that when he prays, he gives thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in his light. You see, it's the Father who qualifies us, not our own works. And we gain this as an inheritance instead of earning it as a wage. And what he's done for us in making us part of his family as, in verse 13, very powerful, he has delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of the son of his love. You know, this idea of taking us out of the power of darkness, I think it presents it to us in two ways. First of all, it's a fact that needs to be accepted in the Christian life, right? This is what is our heritage because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. When Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the dead, was he subject to the powers of darkness? No way. I mean, can you see him in full radiant glory, the resurrected Christ, risen from the dead, triumphing over the cross. Is there anything that the powers of darkness have over him at that moment? Not a single thing. Well, the Bible says that you are identified with the risen Christ. In Christ, the powers of darkness have no authority, have no sway over you whatsoever. And so it's a fact to be accepted into our life but isn't also, it's something to be lived out in our daily life. You see, we might say that the power of darkness can be seen in its effects. And in the the life of those who have been delivered from the power of darkness, those effects 
should be less and less evident in their life. In other words, what does it look like when somebody lives under the power of darkness? Well, just think about it. Think about it in the natural realm. What does the power of darkness do? Well, I don't know about you, but the power of darkness, it lulls me to sleep. I feel like going to sleep under the power of darkness, don't you? When I want to go to sleep, I don't turn bright lights upon my face. I turn out all the lights. And the power of darkness helps lull me to sleep. You know, therefore, no Christian should be a sleeping Christian. We should be awake, active, alive for the Lord. We're not under the power of darkness. That The power of darkness is also skilled at concealing sin. It's amazing how much sin happens under the cover of darkness. How much things don't want to be brought into the open light. Well, when sin is concealed in our life, Aren't we living under the power of darkness to some degree? The power of darkness afflicts men and it depresses them. You know, when the days get short in the wintertime, right? And it's just not very light outside and you go day after day after day without seeing the sun. It's easy to get a little depressed, isn't it? You you want the sunshine. You want the light. You're saying, I get a little bit afflicted and depressed by this. What? In the spiritual life that we live. To be constantly afflicted and depressed is, to some degree or another, to be living under the power of darkness. It's time for such a one to say, I've been delivered from the power of darkness. I need to take this heritage as a son or a daughter from God. It says it right here. Lord, you promised it. You said right here in verse 13, he has delivered me from the power of darkness and you've translated me into the kingdom of the son of his love. That's a real confidence you can have. And so, We shouldn't be lulled to sleep by the power of darkness. We shouldn't be concealing things under the power of darkness. We shouldn't be afflicted and depressed under the power of darkness. We shouldn't be fascinated by the power of darkness. And the power of darkness should not embolden us to sin as darkness emboldens some people to sin. No, 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 no. We have been delivered from the power of darkness. And now we've been translated, as you notice here, it says, into the kingdom of the Son of His love. You know, that's a very special word that is rendered there in verse 13 and has translated us into the kingdom of the son of his love. According to the great uh, Greek linguistic scholar, William Barclay, the word that we translate translated there, the word that we render that, it had a very special significance in the ancient world. When one empire conquered another, the custom was to take the population of the defeated empire and transfer it completely to the conqueror's land. And you would transfer everything. You would transfer everything that could be moved. You would take it to the land of the nation or the kingdom that had conquered the other one. It is in this sense that Paul says we have been translated into God's kingdom. Everything we have, everything we are, now belongs to him. Now, why? Why should everything we have Why should everything we are belong to him? Paul tells you why right there in verse 14. Notice, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Redemption. We've been bought out of the slave market. We've been redeemed by a legal ransom. And the price for our release was paid by the blood of Jesus. We have redemption through his blood. And notice the emphasis there through his blood, through the work that Jesus Christ did on the cross. We'll talk a little bit more about that because Paul will repeat this phrase again this evening. And then he says, going on there in verse 14, in whom we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. The idea there in the original Greek wording is that our sins are sent away because of what Jesus did on the cross for us. Your sins used to be present with you in their guilt, in their power, in their presence. Now, because of the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, the guilt and the stain of our sin is now sent away from us. Now, if you notice here, Paul, in the midst of his prayer, talked about the work of the Father. He's talked now about the work of the Son, Jesus Christ. Bringing up the work of Jesus Christ brings up a topic for very rich meditation for the Apostle Paul. 
Because in the next verses, the next six verses, verses 15 through 20, Paul is going to develop the idea of who Jesus is and what he has done for us. But I want to put this in context. Remember, Paul wrote to the Colossian Christians because they were having problems. And their problems had to do with some false teachings that had come into their midst. And up to this point, Paul has not really discussed the false teachings at all. What he's going to do starting at verse 15 is he's going to start to tell them the truth about who Jesus is. Because what they really needed to understand was who Jesus was. So here we go, verse 15. I'm going to read all the way through verse 20 just because it's such a majestic passage here. And then we'll go back and we'll take it apart piece by piece. Are you ready here? Starting at verse 15. He is, okay, now we remember, we're talking about Jesus Christ, right? That's the subject that was brought up in verse 14. Now we're continuing on to verse 15. The he in verse 15 is Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him to reconcile all things to himself, by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. All right. There's a lot there that's going to concern the rest of our time here this evening, just considering these six verses. First of all, notice, he is. Now, he's making a link from the previous verse where Paul started out thanking the Father for his plan of redemption, and he couldn't do that without also thinking of the Son, who's the great Redeemer. Now, he goes on here, verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God. The word translated image there is the ancient Greek word icon. We get our own English word icon exactly from this ancient Greek word. It means two basic things in the ancient Greek language. It means a likeness, such as the image on a coin could be called an icon, right? You see Caesar's head there on the coin, right? That's an icon of Caesar. It could also mean the image you might see in a mirror. I look at my reflection in the mirror. In this ancient Greek language, you could call that an icon. It could mean a likeness, right? Secondly, it can also mean manifestation. In other words, to make something evident. If I have a book, but I'm hiding it underneath my coat, you can't see it. But when it's manifested, then it is an icon. It's clearly seen. You can see it, and it's manifested. Now, I want you to notice this. When he says that he is the image of the invisible God, Paul is saying something very strong and very powerful. He's saying that Jesus, first of all, is the likeness of the God you can't see. Do you want to know what God looks like? Now, please. I'm not talking about in its physical description. Aren't you happy that we don't have a detailed physical description of Jesus? Aren't you happy that we don't have a painting of Jesus? Well, of course, there's millions of paintings of Jesus, but aren't you glad we don't have a photograph of Jesus? You know what I mean by that. You know, because we would become obsessed with his physical appearance. Wouldn't we be going around to people we already do? Oh, he looks so much like Jesus. Well, how do you know if he looks like Jesus? And what does the mere physical appearance have to do with? No, when we say... That Jesus is the likeness, the image of the invisible God. What we mean is in his character, in his nature, in his personality, in who he is. Everything that makes him as a person, this is what God the Father is like. And isn't it wonderful to think that the invisible God who reigns in heaven, he has shown himself to us in Jesus Christ. You don't have to wonder what God in heaven is like. Look at Jesus. This is the image of the invisible God. Yes, God the Father's invisible. He's in heaven. You can't see him. But he sent his son, right here, verse 15. I'm not making this up. He says, he is the image of the invisible God. He is the likeness. But not only that, he's also the manifestation. 
God is fully revealed in Jesus Christ. Now, I want you to notice something. Where he says there in verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God. The wording was available in the ancient Greek language for Paul to clearly say that Jesus was similar to the Father. He he could have said that if he so chose, but he did not choose that wording. Paul deliberately chose this very strong wording that says he is the image, he is the likeness, he is the manifestation. He, He could have chosen a specific ancient Greek word that means of similar appearance. You know, like you would say, oh my, they're very godly. My, they're very, very godly. You could have applied that word to Jesus in this context, but Paul said, no, that doesn't go nearly far enough. He is the likeness of the invisible God. He is the manifestation. I like how the great Greek scholar A.T. Robertson put it. He said, Jesus is the very stamp of God the Father. And so God is invisible. But it doesn't mean that we can't know what God the Father looks like because we can know his image as seeing it in Jesus Christ. Okay, verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Now, we better pause here for a moment because this is a verse that has been misunderstood by many people. And actually, can you believe it? After this dramatic statement of the deity of Jesus Christ in verse 15, he is the image of the invisible God. Some people believe that Paul turned right around in the second phrase of verse 15 and said that Jesus was not God and that he was a created being. Because they say, oh, well, look, verse 15, he's the firstborn over all creation. See, he had a beginning point. You know, there's heresy that has existed uh, in the world for centuries that has basically said, Jesus Christ is not God. He's the highest of God's creation. In other words, when God wanted to create all things, the first thing he created was Jesus Christ. And then through Jesus, everything else was created. Okay? This is a heresy that has been around for centuries. And people will like to point to this verse. They will say, he is the image of the invisible God, the first, they say, oh, firstborn. See, he was the first created being. Now, listen, you have to just simply go back to what these ancient Greek words mean. The the ancient Greek word protokos, protokos, excuse me, protokos, it can describe one of two things. It can describe priority in time, right? In other words, the first one there, or it can also describe supremacy of rank. So it can mean that you're the first one in line, or it can mean that you're supreme in rank. As Paul used it here, it probably had both ideas in mind, with Jesus being before all things, and of Jesus being of a supremely different order than all created things. He's supreme over all created things, and he's before all things. In no way does the title firstborn indicate that Jesus is less than God. As a matter of fact, to to prove this absolutely conclusively, all you have to do is look at some of the writings of the first century rabbis. First century rabbis, rabbis around the same time as Paul, rabbis that Paul would have read in his own day. And remember, Paul, before he gave his life to Jesus Christ, was a highly trained rabbi. These ancient rabbis called Yahweh, the firstborn of the world. This was a title they applied to God. Ancient rabbis used firstborn also as a messianic title. And so it was very clear that no way was Paul trying to say, as a matter of fact, if Paul was trying to say that Jesus Christ was the first being created, that he is not God, he's a created being, then he would be contradicting himself in later verses. And that ancient Greek word, Protokos has in no means the idea, or or necessarily the idea, that Jesus Christ was the first being created. Because we see it right here very plainly in verse 16. Look carefully here. I'll start reading at verse 15, but let's focus on 16. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation, for by him 
all things were created. Okay, now I want you to stop. If Jesus Christ created all things, is he therefore created? No. Only God, only an uncreated being can create all things. But then you stop. Well, maybe he didn't mean all things there. Matter of fact, I have to say, I don't know if you're familiar with the doctrines and the theology of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, commonly called the Jehovah's Witnesses. Have you ever seen a Jehovah's Witness Bible at this point? I tell you, it's, it's enough to make you laugh. What it actually says here in a New World Translation is it says, for by him all other things were created. And, it, and what's really funny is it puts other in brackets, indicating that they know it's not in the original text. They know it, but they put it in there. Okay, well, maybe Paul meant all other things. Let's read on in the verse. Paul, did you really mean that Jesus created all things? Well, let's let Paul explain. For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. I don't know about you, but that pretty much settles it for me. I don't know how Paul could describe it any more strongly unless you were to go to verse 17. Look at it there. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And I have to say, this is glorious. There is no doubt that Jesus Christ is the author of all creation. That he himself is not a created being. And when we wonder and, 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 and take glory in the world that Jesus created, we worship and we honor him all the more. You know, do you ever find interest in reading scientific things and seeing how glorious this creation is that we live in the midst of? You know what comets are, right? Comets in the, comets in the night sky. Comets have vapor trails behind them. The vapor trail of a comet can be up to 10,000 miles long. Now, if you could take all the vapor that's in a comet's 10,000 mile long vapor trail and put it into a bottle, the amount of vapor actually present in the bottle would take up less than one cubic inch of space. And God can take that and spread it out over 10,000 miles. The planet Saturn, the the, the Rings around the planet Saturn are 500,000 miles in circumference. But they're only about a foot thick. It, it, if the sun were the size of a beach ball and put on top of the Empire State Building, the next closest group of stars would be as far away as Australia is from New York City. I mean, you think about the immense size of the universe, the immense wonder, the immense glory. The, the earth travels around the sun. If you take the speed of a bullet fired from a gun, the earth travels around the sun at eight times the speed of a bullet that's fired from a gun. I mean, this is an amazing world. And Jesus Christ created it all. As a matter of fact, according to the Greek scholar A.T. Robertson, when it says there, all things were created there, it actually means all things stand created or all things remain created. The idea here is not just that Jesus um, created the universe and started it, but that he sustains it. The universe is sustained by Jesus Christ. Now, we need to take another look at verse 16 because it's going to sort of give us a tip-off to what we're going to find later on in the letter. Apparently, and I know it's not evident from verse 16, we'll find it to be evident in later chapters. Apparently, the Colossian heresy had some strange ideas about angelic beings and their place in God's plan. Therefore, Paul wanted it known that not only was Jesus Christ supreme over the created order, 
But Jesus Christ was supreme over angelic beings. That's why he says here in verse 16, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. With those four phrases, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, Paul seems to be describing ranks or orders of angelic beings. Again, we'll talk more about that in future weeks. I just want to plant that idea for you so that we can develop it a little bit further on in later chapters. Now, if you notice here, again, verse 17, he is before all things and in him all things consist. Now, going on to verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning. Jesus is the beginning of all things. He's before all things. And in him, all things consist. Now, not only that, but Jesus lends his greatness. He establishes his greatness, not only in relationship to creation and angelic beings and things visible and invisible, things in heaven and things on earth. But then he also says in verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church. Isn't it funny? Doesn't that almost seem like a letdown? You know what I mean? It's like describing all these great things that Jesus is. And then Paul throws in there, he's the head of the body of the church. What does this tell you? It tells us how precious the idea that Jesus Christ is the head of the body is to him. He rejoices in that. You know, we, we look at Jesus and we say, oh man, you, you created the worlds. You, you did this with the stars. You did this with the rings of Saturn. You did this with the wings of the bees that flapped their wings. You know, you did this with all these amazing things in creation all over the world. It's absolutely unbelievable. And Jesus says, well, if you think that's something, you should see what I do with the church. I take these people, these people, and I somehow put it all together in something that works in some fashion. That's really an amazing work. And we stand back and we say, yes, Lord, that is an amazing work. You know, I tell you, because those rings of Saturn have never resisted God the way that I have, right? The, the great star that God spun into space and, and the earth that hurtles around the sun eight times faster than the bullet fired from a gun. It's never doubted God the way that I have. It's never gone off into air or mistakes the way that I have. And then we realize this may really be the summit peak of what Jesus Christ does. He's the head of the body, the church. Now, guess verse 18, the firstborn from the dead. Oh, isn't that a glorious title? Firstborn from the dead. Jesus Christ, the first of a whole new order of resurrection. Have you ever thought before? Jesus Christ was the first one resurrected from the dead. I know what you're saying. You're saying, no, 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 David, I've read it in the Old Testament. I've read where Elijah raised people from the dead. I've read where Jesus himself raised people from the dead, right? No, no, no. I said resurrected. There's a difference between being resuscitated and resurrected. You know, some people say that Lazarus was the most miserable man that ever lived on the earth. And ancient painters, whenever they painted a picture of Lazarus, whom, of course, Jesus rose from the dead, when they ever painted a picture of Lazarus, they always paint him with a sad expression on his face for two reasons. First of all, he was in heaven and then he got sent back to earth. And then number two, the man had to die twice, right? How would you like that? How would you like to have to die twice? No, thank you. Well, Jesus Christ rose from the dead never to die again. He rose not just in the sense of giving life to his old body, but he rose from the dead in a new order of body, a resurrection body that would never die again. And in that sense, he is truly there, verse 18, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. You might say that that's a very fitting summary of verses 15 through 18, right? Jesus is preeminent. He's first. He's number one. He's out in front. Now, I just want you to consider this for a moment before we conclude with a look at verses 19 and 20. I just want you to consider how important this was for the Colossians to understand. You see, Paul could have started a 15-part series on exposing the Colossian heresy and understanding the deep roots of dangerous Jewish mysticism and Gnostic influences of thought in the pre-modern world or whatever you want to call it. Right? He could have done any of that. But you know what Paul really knew that they needed? He goes, listen, 
if I just exalt Jesus before them in truth, they'll get it. They need to know Jesus. When I think about it, I think about it when we so easily get off track, when we so easily have our life filled with, with these anxieties, with these fears, with these doubts, how often it just comes back to the, how well do I really know Jesus? I mean, would, would I worry the way that I worry if I knew Jesus better? Would I fear the way that I fear if I knew Jesus better? Would, would I be angry the way that I so often get angry if I knew Jesus better? And you just realize, I need to know the Savior of mine better. I need what Paul said way back there, where he said, I need to be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. Well, going on here now to verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. That ancient Greek word fullness is a very interesting word. It was, as a matter of fact, it was a recognized technical term in ancient theology. It expressed the totality of divine powers and attributes. When ancient theologians, you know the the guys that Paul talked to on Mars Hill in the book of Acts, right? When he's there discussing philosophy and theology with all these smart guys from all around, you know, the Roman Empire there at this temple of learning at Athens. And he's there discussing it all with them. I'm sure they use this word sometime or another in the discussion. Well, who is God? And who is God in his fullness? In all of his attributes, in all of his totality. And Paul says, I'll tell you where the fullness of God is. I'll let you know exactly. It pleased the Father that in him, in Jesus Christ, all the fullness should dwell. you got to say, that's amazing, isn't it? First of all, you have to be blown away just at the phrase, all the fullness, right? Isn't that piling superlative on top of superlative? Big idea upon big idea. Not, Not part of the fullness. All of the fullness. It's a grand climax. It's, a, it's bringing together all the previous statements. Image of God, firstborn of creation, creator, eternally preexistent, the head of the church, the victor over death, first in all things. On all of them, he goes, you know what? He's everything. All the fullness of the God, all of the fullness dwells in him. And once you notice, it says there, in him all the fullness should dwell. Specific word that he used there for dwell. There's two words you can use in the ancient Greek language. Now, by the way, I I just want to make something clear. I'm no scholar in ancient Greek. Nobody should think that I am. I know how to use some good Greek resources. But good commentators and word studies and things that I trust tell me that there's two potential Greek words that you could use for this idea of dwell. One means to dwell temporarily, and the other means to dwell permanently. Now, which one do you think Paul used here? permanently. In other words, the deity of Christ, the fullness of of the Godhead, it wasn't something that he put on temporarily, like he put on a coat when he came down from heaven, and when he went back up to heaven, he took it back off again. No, it dwells in him permanently, forever, eternally. It's all fullness. And then you think, it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. I can't read that phrase, it pleased the Father, without thinking of Isaiah chapter 53, 10. You see, first it pleased the Father to bruise him. Now it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. And all that fullness, where has it been put? It's been put into Jesus Christ. Now please note that very carefully. Where is all the fullness of deity? It's not in a church. It's not in a priesthood. It's not in a building. It's not in a sacrament. It's not in the saints. It's not in a method or a program, but it's in Jesus Christ himself. It's as if Jesus Christ, all of it was put into him as a great distribution point so that everybody who wanted more of God and everybody who wanted all that he he, he is and he'll ever be, they could find it there in Jesus Christ. I have to say, as you read this, you just... You just are are humbled, you're awed at how exalted Jesus Christ is. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him, 
to reconcile all things to himself by him, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. I think this is amazing. Because isn't this touching on some of the great themes that we've seen before in the book of Ephesians? Where Paul speaks about God summing up all things in Jesus Christ, bringing this eternal uh, resolving or reconciliation of all matters into Christ Jesus. It's the exact same idea here in verse 20. By him to reconcile all things to himself. Jesus does the reconciling and he is the reconciliation. Whether things on earth or things in heaven, having been, having been, excuse me, having made peace by the blood of the cross. Well, I told you that we would mention the blood of the cross one more time here, right? I find this absolutely staggering. You know, Paul has been dealing up in the heights of the highest theology, right? the highest glories of the fullness of the deity. And you think that Paul just has his scholar's cap on, right? And he's just thinking about high theological ideas and things that are beyond the reach and all the rest of it. And then he concludes there, verse 20, with this, with this amazing phrase, through the blood of the cross. And then you look at the paper that Paul wrote upon. Of course, he dictated his letters, but I like to think of him hunched over a piece of parchment, writing out the letter. And there he is. And as Paul writes, indeed, think of the blood of the cross dripping upon this high theological treatise that he writes. He, he's reminding us that it's not just about the, the, these great and wonderful theological concepts, as, as wonderful and true as they are. But all of that was meaningless without the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. There's a phrase that I want you to become very familiar with, especially as we make our way through the book of Colossians. I want you to become familiar with the phrase, the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And do you understand what we mean by that phrase? By the person of Jesus Christ, we mean who he is. And haven't we seen that in a marvelous way tonight? All his greatness all his glory. There he is. He's the image of God. He's the firstborn of creation. He's the creator. He's the eternally preexistent one. He's the head of the church. He's the victor over death. He's first in all things. He is the fullness of God. That's his person. But don't neglect his work as well. His great work, the blood of the cross. You see, we are saved by both who Jesus is, and by what he has done on our behalf. Both of them are essential. And that's why I'm excited about the weeks ahead of us going through this letter to the Colossians, because we'll get more and more familiar with the person and the work of Jesus in all of its greatness. I suggest to you that this is what we need in our Christian life. You want to talk about getting back to basics, getting back to, to what we need in our Christian life? I don't know of anything greater than getting back to the person and the work of Jesus Christ, who he is and what he has done on our behalf. And God allowing us, that's what we'll do in the coming weeks. So we'll take a break right here. And next time we're together, we're going to pick it up at verse 21, where he starts speaking about how this work is communicated to us and what it does in our life. But let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for the greatness of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. We read just these first 20 verses of the first chapter of this letter that you inspired the Apostle Paul to write to the Colossians. And Lord, as we read it, we're amazed at the glory of both the person of Jesus and his work. We're amazed at who he is and what he's done on our behalf. And so we want to thank you. We want to praise you. We want to ask, Lord, that you give us a greater hunger to know Jesus in both his person and his work. Do it, Lord, for your glory. For your honor and praise, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.